as the mandible is moving, everything should be smooth. And then also everything to be shallow. If you can do that, like you will dramatically reduce your rate of failures with the anterior restoration. Just those two gems that you gave there. Hello, Patricia Rati, I'm Jans Galati, and in this episode, we go one step further, carrying on from basics of occlusion part one, right? Thank you so much for the awesome feedback you guys gave for, for part one, and I'm so happy to have my brother from another mother cut from the same occlusal cloth, Mahmoud Ibrahim, who is a, is a fantastic dentist. You see his work on Instagram, he is amazing, but um, I, just learning about his story from this episode is so, so great, because it's the first time we had a proper chat, I've been following him for a few years now, and I didn't realize that he hated dentistry when he qualified, right? And I look at his work now and I think, whoa, what happened? So as well as so many occlusal gems, so I'm gonna give you a little preview of in a moment that we, that we share with you, I love just him sharing his story with you of what happened, what was the spark that changed him from, from hating dentistry and actually uh, trying to follow a career of making websites to then falling in love with dentistry again in a big way and then really killing it at the moment as he is. Now, I hope you've got your coffee ready because there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna cover in this very intense but very jam-packed episode. Hope you like the analogies and stories and, and cases that we discuss. We're trying to make it as friendly as possible for all my beloved listeners. Uh, the Watchers, it's great to have you. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. But for those who listen, you are the originals. Uh, I will always make sure the content is easy for you to consume on your commutes, right? So the kind of things that we cover is what is the difference between the so-called tripodized contacts and is it really better uh, than cusp to fossa and how can we maximize stability with a cusp to fossa occlusion okay we go very much back to basics there we also talk about what happens when you store someone not in centric relation like we talked about a couple of scenarios where you might do that in the previous episode but what actually happens what are the risks that you accept okay and we also cover what is this concept of freedom in centric or freedom from centric uh, and it, whether we apply it whether we believe in it and if so how do we apply it right so if you're still hungry from that part one occlusion, just listen all the way to the end. There's, it's just absolutely jam-packed. Mahmood, you were absolutely awesome. The protrusive dental pearl from this episode is something that we actually discuss in the episode. And I'm actually just highlight it here. I think it's so good that it deserves its own place, which is basically when you're checking the occlusion, okay, on that topic again, when you're checking the bite, imagine you've done a restoration. Uh, the common thing to do is uh, to stick your articulating paper on the side where you've done the restoration and just look at the marks, right? But what I like to do is after I've uh, finished the restoration, take my rubber dam off, let the patient have a, a bit of a rinse or a swallow or whatever, uh, I just tip them back. Instead of checking the same side where I've done the restorations, I actually check the other side. Now I know my articulate paper is 19 microns, okay? So I check on the other side. Now, if the patient is holding on that side, i.e. The, the articulate paper is not passing through, I know that my occlusion on the right side where I was working is accurate to within 19 microns, okay? Now, if that uh, articulate paper passes through, okay, then I know that I'm out by at least 19 microns. So then what you do, as Mahmoud says in the episode as well, is you double up the articulating paper. Now we're on 38 microns, right? So you bite, bite, patient bites together, you're checking the other side, okay, and now the patient's biting, okay? They weren't at 19, now they are at 38 microns, i.e. thicker paper. So now you know that you need to do between 19 and 38 microns of adjustment, okay? Now you're saying, Jazz, I, I don't know how to do exactly between 19 and 38 microns of occlusal adjustment. It's more to just give you an idea, right? Like ideally, you want to be able to check in the occlusion like with an indirect restoration before you cement, right? So if you can do this before you cement, you know exactly how much you need to adjust. Like I've been there before, adjusting crowns in the past, where I'm just you know doing tiny little adjustments and checking it, tiny little adjustments and checking it. Okay, had I checked this and I know that way I'm way out on the other side. I would be more efficient in my adjustments. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Join the main episode with Mahmood and at the end, I'll reveal one of the future episodes that are planned regarding helping you with your occlusal goals. Welcome, Mahmoud, to the Protrusion Journal podcast. And I just want to say, like, it's, it's been great to know you the last couple of years, uh, mostly on, like, uh, you know, WhatsApp, um, Telegram, social media. I love seeing your adhesive cases that you do. Uh, and I love how much you love occlusion like me. We're real geeks. And, and your contribution to our, our little Telegram group, you know, with over, I don't know, 300-something dentists now, your contribution's always really welcome. You know, so much wisdom that you share. So uh, thank you for coming on, my friend. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I mean, uh, it's very, very flattering, actually, that you uh, you'd ask me to come on here and have a chat with you. Uh, you've had some serious sort of occlusal heavyweights on here. Um, I, I regard you. I regard you in that same light, man. Honestly, some of the content you post and the, and the, and the stuff that you put on Telegram, I, you know you know what you're talking about. And I want to be able to, to, to share that and put you in a pedestal and really you know, champion people like you who have been, you know, like, like I said in the last episode, basis of occlusion, 
like we're all on a journey, right? At different points. And I feel as though we, we mean you have, have had a similar journey, uh, but I, I like how you are constantly running. You're running in this journey and you're like, yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm learning. I'm loving it. Uh, so just give us a flavor actually about, about where you work, Mahmoud, um, where you qualified uh, and what has your, particularly with occlusion, what has your journey looked like? And maybe I'll say a little bit about my occlusal journey in terms of the courses that I've done in the past as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you might find that there's a, the, the crossover is more than you think, uh, because obviously I listen to you on your podcast. So I know a lot about your uh, part of this. So I qualified in uh, Manchester, 2005 and um believe it or not this is probably where our journeys do differ a little bit i absolutely hated dentistry when i qualified i did not want to be a dentist the first five years were me trying to find a way of uh, earning a living not doing dentistry or earning a similar living not doing dentistry wow so you diversified into different fields Give us a flavor. Like, what does that look like? Like, what were you doing? Did you open some sort of a, a franchise or something? Or like, you know, what, what were you doing? No, nothing. I didn't get quite that far. So I taught myself how to sort of build websites. Uh, WordPress and things like that were fairly in their infancy at the time. So it was, um, it was, a, bit, it was a bit more challenging probably than it is now. But yeah, I uh, built a couple of websites. I had an idea for um, you know, doing a bit of a dental buying group sort of thing. Um, I think that exists now. Um, but yeah, I, I tried my hardest to not have to be a dentist for the rest of my life. And then, uh, yeah, looking back at it, I'm like, part of me is like, oh, that was such a waste. But, you know, our paths are all different and I probably wouldn't be where I am now if, if I hadn't taken that time to, you know, to figure out what it is that makes me enjoy dentistry now. So what sparked you? What, what, what changed? Just give us that moment where everything changed for you. What year was it? What happened? Was it a course? Was it a mentor? Was it a patient? Was it an experience that you had that you thought, you know what, actually, I do like dentistry after all. Because like, the reason why this was a shock to me and for those who, who people already follow you know you, like, you produce such beautiful dentistry and you're so, you're oozing uh, passion when it comes to enthusiasm for dentistry. So to, to know that hey, at one stage you were like building websites and you were trying to stay away from dentistry as much as possible, not only is that going to be inspirational to some people who may be going through what you're going through at the moment right and say you know what you can um get to the other side because i think if you are practicing dentistry there's a there's a danger of not loving it there's a, there is a real danger if, if you let the day just if you're clock watching all day long there's listen you know in any job in any profession especially dentistry you don't want to be in that so i want to know to so share with everyone what changed what was the spark it was a uh, <laughs> it was a disappointment it was uh so i was doing a class four composite actually uh, on a patient and i was doing the way uh, i was doing it the way they taught you at dental school you know, um, no rubber dam or object gate, no, you know, your mylar strip. You're not building a, a palatal wall. You're not doing any of that. You're, you're getting the strip in place somehow. You're squeezing all that composite in, you're pulling it and you cure it and you kind of end up with what you end up. And I looked at it and I was like, this is absolute garbage. It's rubbish. Um, so I was like, well, okay. Every other thing I've tried so far to get me out of the industry hasn't worked. If I'm going to do it, let me at least do it well. And believe it or not, the first place I went was YouTube. Uh, things were probably, yeah, so this was in, this was about five years in, so it was 2010, maybe. And um, qualified 2005, Manchester 2010-ish. Uh, yeah, just started looking up YouTube videos. How do you do decent looking class four? And as I started to get into it and realize all the tools you had at your disposal, and I started getting better. And my crown fits went from being, oh my God, I hope it fits. Oh my God, I hope the occlusion's okay. Uh, what is occlusion? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. When it became, I know this is going to work. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the occlusion part of things, actually, again, I probably will find this is very similar to you. Um, it was, uh, what's it called? Um, Dental Town. Yes, DT. Yeah, yeah Dental Town. Yeah. The original DT. Yeah, man. Um, you know, Leno, Chi, Michael Melkers, John Nosty, these people. So I was, I was starting to get into my dentistry and I was like, okay, I want to do slightly more uh, intricate work, slightly more complex work. And um, I was seeing these guys producing this work. And the great thing about that uh, website at the time was, you know, they'd be step by step. And especially the people we call mentors now, you know, you've got Michael Melkers and Leno, Chi. They didn't just before and after. And uh, there you go. It's more of a, here's the before. This is what the patient presented with what would you do? And it wasn't, I do 17 veneers. It was, how do you find out how to 
how are they going to last? You know, how are you going to make them last? How are you going to make them look good? And it was all about making uh, making a method out of it so that you can actually get to a good end point. And what I respect about both those clinicians is that they they're really also great educators in the realms of communication as well. Like, how do you communicate a big case rather than hey, you need you know seventeen crowns or whatever? Like, hey, you know what? Here's a problem. But are you going to own your problem or not? In a way, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where it started really because I learned luckily without making too many of my own mistakes what to look for uh in terms of red flags and things and um and that's kind of where it started it became a like uh, growing up when i was at school and stuff like my favorite topic this is gonna sort of sound such as so geeky but it was physics right physics i really enjoyed because you could be giving you could be given a certain uh set of facts you know about how the world works and you can then take that and apply it to a new situation and figure out and possibly predict what's going to happen. Whereas biology or something, some of it is a lot more learn, you know, learned by memorizing or that sort of thing. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I, I kind of always equate occlusion to physics in a way because it's all about force distribution. It's all about resistance. It's all about figuring out how to make things last in a hostile environment. Um, and it's kind of like the CSI part of, of dentistry, if you like. And that's what drew me to it. It was very, uh, each patient is different and you just got to put the pieces together and, and try and come up with a, a formula that would work for them. That, that's a really cool way to put it. And I always, um, as you've heard me say many times a podcast, like, you know, as Steve Jobs said, you, you, you can only join the dots when you look back. And then we look back at your physics interest and then it only makes sense that, okay, you're applying it through occlusion. Uh, and you're right, there's so many similarities there. Like, you know, in a hostile environment, like aerospace engineers, they're designing these airplanes to work in a hostile environment and they're thinking, okay, what about the force? You use that man uh, word force distribution and I, and I mentioned about the uh, force management that Ed McCarran said in, in the last episode and I, I definitely see occlusion like that. Now, there is a danger uh, and I know you know this already. It's more, I'm just sharing this for everyone else. There is a danger in making it like over, in, in making it too much about engineering and then dissociating that from the patient as well because there's so much resilience that everyone has. You can get away with a lot as well, but it's knowing with which, 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 with which patient you can get away with it and which one you can't, uh, and then being able, being able to apply the, the force management because you want your work to last longest, but also realizing that there's a whole biopsychosocial element uh, to it as well. Um, so let's just, why don't we just dive right in uh, to the, the main question. Uh, you know, I've got four or five questions I want to just uh, quiz you on, but then also uh, add my input and then also have a little debate and i said to you already man if we disagree with something which i don't think will happen but i'm ex if it does happen amazing because i want to be able to to just uh sound out a couple of ideas right so when planning for contacts what i mean by that is when you uh do your restoration and you stick your articulating paper in and you get the patient to bite together what should those dots look like now there is something called uh tripodized contacts uh and and for a bit of history it's like more uh nathology and this is essentially uh, it's like a cusp to fossa so the lower let's say the lower molar lower first molar the buccal cusp in the the central fossa of the upper molar except there's now uh, that that cusp is making three little dots in that fossa right it's making three little tripodized dots okay uh, and um but before i really go into it do you want to just explain what your understanding is, is there any more that you want to uh, add on to that yeah no that's exactly right and i think another important point to make is that it's it's important that the cusp tip in tripodized contacts does not make contact with the opposing tooth that that's part of the definition i believe so the tip itself the, the very tip of the cusp doesn't actually yeah it's the, the the three point contact where into which the cusp sits prevent the cusp tip from hitting uh, the bottom of the fossa if you like Yep, and then that's good because with the, with the tripodized contacts, the main uh, claim benefit, and it makes sense with, in, in terms of engineering, is that the net result of the force from this tripod is uh, through the long axis of the tooth, which which makes sense engineering wise. And but 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 there is a problem with that, uh, and this is why uh, many of us, uh, including myself, and I know you have as well, have moved to to Custer Fossa. So so just talk about uh, what are the the challenges? Uh, maybe when you first learned about, it, did you try doing tripodized, or did you learn from a mentor? So actually, this may be overkill. Uh, what are the challenges when you're trying to implement this tripodized dentistry? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the way I learned specifically, I'm a very visual person. So the way I looked at it when I was looking at tripodized uh, contacts versus cost to fossa was, okay, so if I'm going to try and replicate this, 
whether it be in a direct restoration or an indirect restoration. First of all, it's very, very difficult to achieve. Can you see that, Mahmoud, by the way? Can you see this? I'll just put the image up. Can you, can you, can you see this? Oh, yeah, got it. All right, sweet. So this is, uh, you know, for, uh, obviously me and you, uh, we're going to make sure that we respect the listeners of the podcast while you're commuting, com- chopping onions, gardening, that kind of stuff. But if you're watching on YouTube, then you can see a visual, but we've described it. So this is just a visual aid for those who are watching. So, so as you can see, I mean, the, the three point contact sort of in the middle of that lower molar, for example, being able to build your cusps in that fashion, getting each one exactly right to get even contact on each side with the opposing tooth is difficult. Now, let's say you're just going to grind it down into that. If somehow you grind one of them slightly more than the other two, you've then introduced incline contacts, which are very, you know, inherently unstable, as we know. Um, But even say you get it right on that first time. Now, what's stopping the patient from wearing one of those contacts more than the other two? And again, introducing an incline contact. The last one again, is more of a brain exercise is depending on how close those contacts are, you know, the, the, that tripod, how small that tripod is, if it's a bit bigger, how hard are you getting your patient to clench when you're checking that contact? Because that is then going to affect how much shearing force you're going to put on, on the sides of those cusps. So if you're not doing it hard enough, what if they are a nighttime clencher or daytime clencher or whatever? And you've done this in, 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 in your beautiful ceramic and you find that it starts to crack. So it's just, and then the last thing I guess is, is it necessary? I know that the concept was introduced to give the tooth positional stability, but I think we've seen through um, Panky, Dawson, Spear, I mean, they all teach cusp fossa, um, uh, yeah, as you saw on the, on the picture there. So I've just put a photo of the cusper fossil on which we'll describe and go into and maybe the advantages over the tripodos. But as you're saying, you're saying exactly how I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, we, we can't forget, for example, that the main thing we learn at dental school, for example, about positional stability for teeth is in neutral zone. Now, your neutral zone is still there. So uh, if you can get one or two, maybe even three, because fossa contacts on the tooth, it's sitting within a socket, within a periodontal ligament. You've got the tongue, the cheek on either side. You've possibly got mesial and dis- uh, teeth on the mesial and distal. Chances are it's going to be stable. It's probably an unnecessary addition, uh, <laughs> unnecessary complexity to add the tripodization. Well, the, the only thing we haven't mentioned is that, okay, uh, we mentioned the, the case of a direct case and you're trying to get those contacts and the challenges that we have here. And then also about what if the patient's a clencher and then how well you've engineered that tripod. But also, if you're doing any, if you're doing a big case, a full mouth rehab case, and you've prescribed to your technician a tripod scheme, like your technician will be spending forever and a day to try and get that. And then, you know, what is the chance that as you uh, uh, fit those crowns, it's going to be exactly how it was on the articulator? Okay, we know that doesn't happen. And, and therefore, then you're grinding and doing it. And then essentially, you're getting these cuspal, uh, cuspal incline contacts. So um, it's, it's much easier and better. And by the way, I just want to pay um, uh, respect to Mr. E.M. Langenwalter, DD, is it? DMD uh, for these uh, images. That's why I've kept his EML on there because this is his work. So it's one, this is one of the, the clearest diagrams I could find online of a, of a tripodized versus custo fossa. So um, yes, lab work uh, is going to be uh, challenging with that. So it's not best to do. And then one thing I'm going to just um, summarize that you just said there is that, okay, if you're going for tripodized contacts, um, what is the alternative? We know cusp fossa, but then some people might say that, oh, with cusp fossa, then you, because you only have one contact, it's, it's not stable enough. But just as you said, we know the tooth is not going to go mesial and distal because you've got a tooth either side. You've got the contacts. We know it's not going to go buccal or, 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 or lingual because it's in the neutral zone, right? Uh, and, and therefore, this serves the purpose and it fulfills the purpose of maintaining that vertical position of the tooth. And together, this is why many dentists are, are cusp fossa. But one thing I know that you're very good at, because you've spoken about this before, is that actually the definition doesn't just finish at, at cusp to fossa. It's, it's, a, it's a cusp to a, a, a flat area, a flat landing pad or, or, or a flat, flat area rather than finishing on incline. Now, I know you are very good at implementing this. You know, you showed me photos of you implementing this. It's something that you've been speaking about in our Telegram group as well. So you might, if you don't mind just um, explaining a little bit about, uh, about um, how to maximize Castro Fossa for our benefit in terms of the, the flat areas and what's the benefit of that? So it's all about simplifying the, uh, the process in order to get the end result correct for the patient. Um, Basically, uh, landing pad occlusion 
is something I learned uh, off of um, Michael Melkers and Lane Ochi initially. And um, the concept is that you take the where where the opposing tooth is going to contact your restoration, and instead of it being at the bottom of a fossa, you raise the bottom of that fossa up into like a little um, flat receiving area where the stamp cusps or the functional cusps uh, directly contact, thus directing the uh, force down the long axis of the tooth, number one. Number two, it gives you uh, uh, an area that's very easy to adjust. If the occlusion is high, and um, we can maybe talk about the trick of you know, figuring out how high by doubling up your articulating pepper, etc. Um, but it's very easy to grind that flat area down, keeping it flat. Um, whereas if you're trying to deepen a fossa, it becomes very tricky. And the other thing it does is because that area is flat and it's usually sort of hard, you know, maybe a millimeter diameter, or at least that's what I tell my technicians to do, it's got sort of inbuilt into it something we will discuss later, which is that freedom uh, incentric uh, concept. Yep. Uh, so that's why I really, really like it. Uh, and, it and it's made my indirect restoration uh, adjustment fit so much easier. Absolutely right. And it just makes sense physically rather than having you know, three dots, you're now going Custer Fossa, but not just Custer Fossa in the, in the depth of the fossa. You actually have a, a strategic area which is going to be perpendicular to that um, functional cusp or the stamp cusp. Uh, and just it's not only is it beneficial to us as dentists, for the technician, because it's easier for them to make. Uh, and it gives us that sort of um, freedom in centric or freedom from centric. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, that's so, so the, the, the conclusion of this question is, OK, we used to do tripartized contacts because nathologists believe this was the optimal way. Now the change has happened to, to, to cusp to fossa, but it's a cusp to um, a flat receiving area or landing pad, different terminologies. And, and that makes sense. Now, uh, before we get on to like how to check how high the occlusion is uh, a little bit, I just want to... Um, Ask a really important question, which is some dentists might be thinking uh, uh, listening to us and thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does that mean I now have to start fiddling around with everyone's natural fossas to, to create these flat landing pads? Um, what do you say to that? Like, you know, how can we implement this on, on Monday morning? When should we should we be implementing this and when should we be accepting the status quo? Um, I mean, if if the patients, I mean, you know, this is. I think there was a, I can't remember who said it, but uh, it was either Pete Dawson or one of those who said, uh, oh, I did uh, hundreds of equilibrations on hundreds of patients and some of them may have even needed it. It's a kind of, kind of a similar concept where if someone's got no functional problems, they don't have tooth wear, they don't have tooth mobility, they don't have sensitivity, they don't have TMJ issues, muscles, headaches. If everything's working for them, there's absolutely no need to change it. But the only time I apply these concepts is I'm restoring the tooth anyway. And all I'm trying to do is give the patient something that's going to work so they can chew on it. It's not going to be sensitive. It's not going to break. It's, well, hopefully it won't break. Um, so, you know, you only apply these things when, when, when there's a need uh, because you are already doing some dentistry or sometimes it's, you know, yeah, the patient has a, an aesthetic concern. That is there. That, that's the main reason they're here. But you are also responsible for making sure that your dentistry lasts. So if you're going to then be changing the guidance or opening the vertical because you want to you know, give them more freedom, whatever it is, then again, I would apply these principles because just, just because their natural dentition had something for a while, if I'm then going to be putting my own stuff in there, I'm going to give it the highest chance of success without compromising things like aesthetics or function. You know, I'm not going to give patients teeth they can't chew with just because then they won't be able to break them. Um, but you also want to use as many of these tips and tricks as you can to make your life easier, to make your work more predictable. I just want to, I just want to highlight that, moment, and I completely agree with you. And the reason it's important to highlight that is because I don't want young dentists to listen to this, and, and then next Monday morning, they check the patient's mouth, and the patient's got like uh, some crazy skeletal class three occlusions. Like, oh my God, I've got to get my handpiece out and start drilling to create these uh, flat landing pads. No, no, it's, it's not the case at all. So the, the, the way I like to explain it, just like you know, to add on to the beautiful way that you said it, is um, a, a one definition by Jeff Oakson. So Jeff Oakson, very big name in the world of TMD occlusion. Um, he, he, he defined the dynamic individual occlusion, okay, which is the occlusion is considered acceptable if the patient is functioning efficiently without pathosis. 
Okay, so uh, that's one thing. And then when I did the Dawson Academy, Ian Buckle, uh, following on from Pete Dawson, introduced uh, the concept of, okay, you have your general patients and your complete patients. And your general patients are the ones who, you know, even though they have an AOB, okay, they're st- you know, they don't have any fractures. They don't have much wear. They're, they're doing fine. They don't have any pathology at all. No TMD. Uh, they're doing fine. Stop. Don't fiddle around with them for the sake of fiddling around with them and, and changing anything because they are, their occlusion is working for them. Then you got your other patients whose occlusion is not working for them. And then they may or may not also want an aesthetic improvement, or they may not have like several carish lesions. And then you need lots of uh, crowns and restorations. Now, if you're going to be now doing, committing yourself to dentistry anyway, then just like you said, why not take that opportunity to maximize success uh, and put this engineering concepts in to, to, to get better longevity? So that's why it's important to say that, hey, don't go around thinking that, okay, everyone needs to have this. If, or if what they have is already working for them, great. But if you're intervening, whether it's single tooth and you're just going to make your crown and you're going to tell your technician, just like you do, to have this. And, you, and we'll talk about the level of training that you individually need to you know, speak to your technician, have that communication, because you can't just write in your technician's lab slip. Please give a um, cusp to um, flat landing plat occlusion and they'll just do what you want. You have to spend that time. Sit down. with. No, what I did was got them to come on uh, your course. <laughs> I, came, I got both of them to come on uh, the 2020 occlusion. Amazing. Course. That, that was so good to see. And, you know, massive uh, hats off to you for, for getting them on there and massive kudos to them for wanting to learn and say okay how can i make better work for my mood you know so so th- that that is a uh, amazing uh, so that we can maximize the time we you did mention there's not the official question but we, as we're talking uh, let's talk about a scenario where you you know patient bites together after your restoration and now it's high or it's proud um I've got a little video that I put on just recently uh, about uh, nine little techniques, little tips to make sure that you don't have a high restoration. But let's say well, we are proud. Um, what is that little trick that we're going to say about doubling up your articulating foil? Okay, so we're assuming we've already cemented it in. Yeah, let's go for it. You cemented it in and the patient bites together and yeah, we think we're high. Yeah, I mean, assuming you know the thick- you need to know the thickness of your articulating paper, but I would put it in on the contralateral side. Um, it, you know, let's say it's 20 microns and it pulls through. I would double it up put it in on the contralateral side. If it pulls through, you know that you're going to need to reduce by at least 40 microns, maybe more, double it up again. And you keep going basically until it holds. And that will give you an indication of how high your restoration is. Now, obviously, ideally, you probably want to do this before you've cemented on. Um, because if it turns out that you've got to reduce a millimeter and you know you've only done a, a millimeter and a half of reduction, uh, which again might come onto something we speak about later, um, you probably want to re-prep. Absolutely. And so th- that's beautiful. And it's a good, great way to test it. And, and uh, in, in the opposite scenario, you know, you, you check uh, and the patient is biting. So sometimes when I'm checking the occlusion, I'll, I will do this technique straight away. I won't even check the occlusion on the side I'm working on. Uh, you probably do the same. I check on the contractor side. Okay, they're holding my 20 microns. So I know that I'm at least within 20 microns. I'll then pull out my sh- shim stock foil and check the contractor side. Okay, they're holding on the shim there. Amazing. I'm within eight microns now. And then I'll check the tooth in front and behind the one I've worked on. And if they're holding it, I'm I'm there, right? I don't need to check anything really. Uh, so, so that's a, a good way of doing it. So I'm glad we've covered that as well. So look at how much value we're trying to build into this episode. Uh, shall we move on to now? What do we check in a basic occlusal examination? Okay, so um, what, uh, when I did my uh, I did my MSc at Manchester with uh, Stephen Davies, and uh, he yeah, absolutely, and uh, he uses a form on his TMD clinic in uh, in Manchester called a three minute articulatory system exam, and I found this fantastic because it gives you a very easy to follow checklist of uh, of everything you need to check, um, and it's something. We can. I, I asked him uh, by email, can I share? This was like four years ago. I asked him, hey, can I share this with dentists? And he, was, he emailed me back saying, yeah, that's co- totally fine. So you reminded me. What we'll do is uh, if you go to the, uh, the the blog post for this website and on the Telegram and on the Facebook group, I'll stick it on. So it's three-minute uh, occlusal examination, what you need to record. And it's really quick and easy. It's really uh, valuable information by Stephen Davies. You know, all his work, amazing. We'll stick that on to benefit us all. Now, I've, uh, I've, I've added a few little bits to it. Um, in terms of additional things, or or maybe you know, what do you do when it's an you know the result or your finding is negative, or you find a problem? Because 
if everything's a no, 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 and everything's clear, it's fine. You're done. But what, what do you start to look at if if it's a positive and that isn't on there? So it just just as a, a memory jogger. Can, can can we put the Mahmood modified version if that's okay with you? <laughs> I'm not going to claim it's a mo- mo- yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all, all credit to him for that. And uh, but yeah, so it covers things like you know checking uh, the TMJ palpation for pain. You're checking for noises, so clicking, popping, crepitus. Um, I don't have a Doppler, but I, I do like to use a stethoscope. And, um, and then you're looking for range of motion, uh, protrusive, lateral, um, maximum opening, and you're looking for any deviation. And then we do the muscle uh, palpation, uh, origin, insertion, um, and I, like you, also don't believe that the lateral thyroid can be palpated, so I do a resistance uh, test. Um, and then the rest of that form goes into um, skeletal class, incisor class, and then, C- again, something we'll look at later, which is, does CR occur in MIP? So that's actually something we'll need to clarify on the form because it says CR does it equal CO? Which is using the older definition, uh, exactly. Which is which is why everything you know it just goes back to this the definitions, right? So yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So we'll we'll clarify that, but um, and then it goes into checking things like uh, working side interferences, working side uh, non-working side interferences. I put them in air quotes, um, and then uh, whether the patient has canine guidance, group function, etc. And then at the bottom, it's got a um, sort of compression test. Now, I used to wonder whether that's the same as a load test or not. I think the objective is slightly different because you're only compressing the joint on one side. So um, basically, you put like a, a tongue spatula or a cold roll yeah, on one side to get the patient to squeeze hard. And if you, again, this is where I go back to sort of visualizing and physics. And you're, if you've got something in between the teeth on this one side and you squeeze, you can imagine your condyle is going to move a little bit higher up on this side and compress the joint space. If that, if you get pain on this side, it could be that there's an intracapsular problem, but it also helps tell you if there is discomfort on this side, that it might be muscular. And again, it's not, you know, you're not dissecting the patient, you're not doing an MRI, not, you know, it's a three minute exam. So it's just to give you a base uh, to start the, the the compression test I I learned it as it is low testing one side, you know it is low testing one side at a time, uh, so it's very uh, similar and I think it can be useful. So a lot of people tell me, hey Jazz, what do I do? I don't have a a, a leaf gauge, um, and I, that's the advice I give them. Okay, get a spatula on the other side, and then the only difference to add on to that is uh, I would actually what I do is I uh, use a, a hand, the palm of my hand, and I put it on the angle of the mandible. mandible the opposite side to where the spatula is, and I actually push a little bit. So I'm really maximizing how far the condyle is going up against uh, the glenoid fossa. Yeah, so that is just giving the extra, and then you find out, okay, is there a, a, you know, a load test, um, a negative or positive? So I've just got a little diagram here for those watching, but again, we'll describe it. Like uh, the side that you put the spatula, it almost gaps the joint. The physiotherapist called gapping the joint, right? So you're 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 moving the entire ball, uh, entire mandible, like in a in a side to side kind of way. So now there's a gap supposedly where you've got a spatula because the spatula is in the way between the teeth. There's a gap, but on the other side there's compression. So um, as you get the patient to bite together and you put your man uh, your hand on the angle of the mandible, push upwards. That is a way of of uh, load testing, and it's great that um, uh, Stephen Davies has this on the form because not everyone has access to a leaf gauge. So this is the quick and easy way to, to do that. So that's awesome. Brilliant. Um, I mean, I, I, if you don't mind, I wanted to go in, uh, sort of a little bit into how I, because uh, it's, it's great to do this on every patient because then you have a baseline. Um, I do also maybe think about things a little bit differently when I know what I'm doing for the patient. So uh, Spear, so Spear teaches, I think, four positions of occlusion, right? Um, but the one of them has two lumped into it. So I tend to think of five. So you got, and if you think from as far back as you could go, no, well, okay, yeah, let's consider it, yeah, as far back as you can go physiologically and comfortably, all the way forward, it's easy to think about. So you got center correlation, then a little bit for, further forward, you got MIP, that's two. Further forward is your, your pathways, your guidance pathways. Now there's protrusive, lateral, laterotrusive, whatever, it's the, the guidance pattern. And then you end up on some form of edge 
to edge position. And then past that, you got crossover. So generally, the way I'll think about it is with what I'm doing, with whatever treatment I'm doing, what am I going to be changing? You know, what is my restriction going to be in the way of? So, you know, uh, a few of the cases I've posted on my Instagram recently are sort of composite veneers and things like that. It's, you know, everybody's doing them these days. So if it's a purely facial composite veneer, you're not going to be changing, you're not going to be affecting CR. Um, obviously, we said you do the baseline examination because you want to know that there isn't any pathology or there isn't any reason to interfere with those positions. But assuming that the examination is clear, uh, your composite veneer is not going to affect CR. Chances are it's not going to affect MIP. It might affect the guidance pattern depending on how much length you're adding. So then I'm thinking, all right, I'm just going to make sure that whatever length I add isn't going to make the guidance any steeper. So by making sure that the composite that I add, if the, you know, if the angle of the platal surface is sort of that way, you know, whatever the angle of the platal surface is at the moment, I'm either going to try and maintain that or make it shallower. Um, and then you've got your edge to edge position, which is probably the most important when you're doing something like composite veneers. You want to make sure that on that terminal, you know, on the, when the patient sat on the edges, again, you get force distribution and everything is smooth. And by smooth, I mean when the patient gets onto the edge or if they want to slide on the edge, there isn't any clunkiness to it. There isn't any point the patient can grab hold of and, and, and add uh, uh, resistance because you know, that resistance means they can put more force on because, well, their mandible isn't moving, so they're just going to push harder. Um, and then the same sort of thing with crossover. You know, you don't if the patient naturally goes past the canine position. So crossover is basically once the patient has guided, let's say left and they're coming onto the tip of their canine and they're sitting on that tip, that's their canine guidance. Once they go past that tip, they're into then crossover. Now, if they go past that tip and it's a big drop, you know, or you know, for their central incisors. Or they crash together. Yeah, or, or yeah, exactly. The, the, the lower incisors crash into the, the back of the central. Jerky movements. It's, it's, it's about uh, identifying and eliminating those jerky movements from the transitions. Exactly. Keep everything nice and smooth. The patient has nothing to grab hold of and push against. That's probably, hopefully, going to make sure your restorations last a lot longer. I, th I think in the last 60 seconds, what you've covered here is if you can program your restorations to always uh, have a degree or a high degree of smoothness. And I don't mean like a highly polished surface. I mean, as the mandible is moving, everything should be smooth. And then also everything to be shallow. If you can do that, like you will dramatically reduce your rate of failures with your anterior restoration. Just those two gems that you gave there will make a massive difference to everyone who's listening or watching uh, or to their restoration. Just remember, if you don't remember anything else from this episode, smooth, if you remember smooth and shallow, okay, you'll be absolutely fine. So I'm, I'm glad you've added that uh, in. Now, in the interest of time, uh, let's go to, because, you know, following on from smooth and shallow, let's talk a little bit about uh, freedom from centric or freedom in centric. Um, I've got a diagram to show later as well. In fact, let me just load it up and then we can talk about it while I've got the diagram up. This is probably, this might well be the one place where not necessarily we disagree, but we might have differing, uh, not conclusions, but yeah, just. Uh, okay, so um, tell me about um, whether you believe in or you uh, incorporate freedom in centric but, or freedom from centric, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but, you know, from the way, what, are you, what, is, what is it that you understand about this concept? Freedom in, uh, freedom in centric, freedom from centric, long centric. I see them as all the same thing. Um, and I think it was introduced by Schuller, Schuller uh, a while back about, yeah. And it was basically supported by the theory that CR or centric relation is not a pinpoint position. Now, I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but to me, that tends to make sense, mainly because if you take a system such as the uh, articulatory system, you've got, you've got two very big shock absorbers in the system. You've got the disc and you've got the periodontal ligament. Now, any system that has shock absorbers in it, there's going to be some play. Uh, again, just that's the way it makes sense in my head. So to assume that centric relation is a, an exact pinpoint didn't sit well with me. So this makes sense. And it's all about taking something that you're designing on an articulator, putting it then in, a, in the mouth. They're not the same, 
the articulator is there to basically the only function of the articulator is to make sure that you're adjusting for less time in the mouth, basically. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So you can't, I don't want to call it a fudge factor, but freedom does give you a little bit of room for error. That's one function. Okay. So that's why we talk, when we talk about landing pad occlusion, because the, the other time, the other thing is when I first got introduced to uh, freedom centric, it was really an anterior, you know, something to do with the anterior teeth. A little bit of room behind the upper incisors for the patient to wiggle. So, so uh, 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 that's I, I believe that is the uh, the long centric concept, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a very similar context. So you, you, in one in long centric, you're looking anterior posteriorly, uh, and freedom and centric, you're looking uh, uh, left and right. Is that the what you follow as well? The thing is, I, th- I think um, it's probably one of those things that. It, in practical terms, it doesn't matter. Like it, it needs to be in all those directions because the, the patient, you can't tell them, okay, you, you can have freedom forwards and backwards, but I'm going to lock you in left and right. So you deal with it. So I just think, again, it gives you, uh, uh, and the thing I didn't understand before was like, okay, you're giving them this freedom at the front, but if you're giving them tripodized occlusion at the back, what's the point? They can't move anyway. So this is why landing pad occlusion, giving them that room, to wiggle around, couple it with the anterior long centric, um, give them that freedom to move slightly where the teeth are still actually loaded. So that's the important thing is it because if you just give them that room, but they, they are moving and hitting the inclines at the back. Yeah, there is a problem. So they're, they're still actually loaded on the teeth. But as soon as they've gone past that area of freedom, you're engaging the anterior guidance. Now, the, yep. the, the other advantage is as, because they've moved a little bit, hopefully you're thinking that condyle has started to move. And hopefully if you can get the condylar uh, movement in harmony with your anterior guidance, you're going to separate the back teeth. Everything's going to be, again, that magic word, just nice and smooth and as shallow as needed. Uh, well, as shallow as can be, while still discluding your back teeth. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my thought with, with, with freedom uh, centric, basically. I, I, I agree. And just to add on to that, uh, I think the terms, is it freedom in centric or freedom from centric? Uh, it doesn't really matter because the, the term centric here is used as, a, as the MIP, centric occlusion. Okay, so just whatever their bite is, and I usually when we're doing you know, rehab dentistry, it is in within the arc of centric relation, so i.e. Uh, centric relation and MIP are one and the same when they're sort of, you know, designing either these splints or uh, this many restorations or rehabilitations. So let's just take it from that. And then uh, as you move within that space or away from centric relation, there is a bit of freedom. And I like to call this like a wiggle room, okay? And sometimes to understand what something is, we must understand what it isn't, okay? So I, I, I learned freedom uh, in centric or freedom front centric the best way I, I learned it is to, to rationalize it like this, okay? First, learn what it isn't. It isn't this, okay? It isn't that as soon as you uh, bite together, okay, you, A, you're locked in, and B, when you grind left and right, immediate, like, I mean, absolute immediate disclusion, like you're pretty much on an incline and you're just discluding straight away. That's what it isn't. What it is is that when you bite together, you can just little bit, tiny bit, tiny wiggle room left and right, a little bit forward, okay, before that incline starts, okay? Now, it is debatable, and we will never know whether this has any success or importance or, or bearing, but uh, just like it does to you, it makes sense to me as well. In a system which has got um, squashy parts uh, to, to, to give, make your life easier, to have a little range rather than a pinpoint area, uh, but also I just do find that this also reduces resistance, right? Because they have that initial flat bit, they're not on an incline straight away, and that is contributory uh, to reducing resistance. So I, I, it's something I uh, would incorporate uh, in a bigger case, but um, here's what I do. I'm going to stop sharing my uh, slide now. Here's what, how I incorporate it into orthodontics. So this is what Andy Toy taught me. So uh, I started to apply this to, to orthodontics in the way that when I finish an Invisalign case, okay, uh, and for those who do orthodontics, any form of orthodontics, just when, you, when you're finished, okay, get the patient to bite together and get them to clench hard and get them to grind left and right. Now, I had a case the other day. It was a class three case I had, and I just got rid of the anterior crossbite. But now, when I got her to grind left and right, her upper lateral was in frematis, okay? 
We don't want that, okay? Because if that was a tooth that was um, in crossbite, now I got it, got, got it back into position. The reason it was in Fremitus is because all those years of being in crossbite, it never had any pathway wear. So it had this like uh, massive, uh, kind of like mammalons, but this huge concavity of, of the uh, palatal of the incised ledge, right? Whereas if you look at the other teeth, they, they, they were nice and flat. So uh, I got my burr out, I smoothed it to sort of accelerate it. Now people uh, often think, um, like some orthodontists say, no, 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 I'm not going to do any tooth adjustment. I'm going to do lots of, put the patient in nine months of finishing to get everything uh, as it is. That doesn't make sense to me because the best analogy I have for this is like, imagine the, the maxilla is, is a lock and the mandible is a key, right? Now, through orthodontics, you are tampering with that lock and you're tampering with that key. You can't expect the, 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 the lock and the key to now fit together. Yes, they are the same lock, same key, but just slightly different, right? So you need to now get um, your, your tools out to just reshape that key and reshape that lock so now things fit together better. So the way I can make it tangible in terms of that orthodontic case is I do a bit of adjustment on that uh, palatal of the lateral incisor in enamel, okay? Now I check again, still a bit of fremitus, okay? But not so much. Again, I get a soft flex this, just smooth it out. Get rid of that sharp corner of the leading edge of the lower incisor, okay? Again, that contributes to making it smoother as well, okay? And patients love that, okay? And now that tooth is no longer in fremitus, but now here's the magic thing, okay? So as, as per Andy Toy taught me this, and I've been using it and getting lots of success is, you get the patient to clench together, grind, okay? And then as they grind left and right, you, you ask the patient, can you tell me if you can feel that there is a back tooth in the way? Is there a tooth that's in the way? And straight away she said, yeah, over here. So she pointed to her upper left premolar and I put my finger on it and I got to grind left and right and that was in heavy contact. Now the, the beauty is when you finish an invisaline case, all the teeth are mobile, right? They're a little bit mobile because everything's moving, right? So you can actually feel it more on your finger. And when you just adjust that a little bit, now you don't need much adjustment. You're just, you're almost creating a flat landing pad with your rugby ball burr. Just literally a tiny, bzz, that's it. That's all you need. And then get the patient to bite together and grind left and right again. Yeah, everything feels smooth and even. And that for me is, is, is how you finish uh, an orthodontic case as inspired by Andy Toy. And I've been getting a lot of success with that. So now there's no more fremitus. Everything's balanced. Everything feels smooth and everything feels comfortable with the patient. And the patient is not aware of any tooth as she is clenching and grinding. And, and, and that's the whole point. I want to test it during the clench. I want to test it when it's going to be maximally loaded. I want to test it through a potential uh, parafunctional activity. And if we test everything to parafunction, when we hope that it'll, it'll, it'll surpass it uh, in function. So that's a, another way of how I incorporate this little bit of freedom um, within the patient's post uh, orthodontic occlusion. That's fantastic. And that analogy is, is Thank brilliant. Thank you. I thought of it this morning before, before I speaking to you, I thought, okay, let me think. I, I did, I did, I did. I was, I, was, I was thinking, okay, how can I explain this the best? Uh, <laughs> I literally thought of this morning, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to use it. Thank you, Raj. I'm glad you liked it. So, okay, we talked about freedom from centric and how we both like it. Uh, and again, once again, it doesn't mean that we go to all our cases and start incorporating this in when everything's working for that individual. It's when we are doing dentistry. It's where we're doing a full mouth rehabilitation in enamel, aka orthodontics. It's when we're doing uh, crowns and, and anterior restorations. You want a little bit of wiggle room, right? So I hope that helps people in terms of uh, learning the definition. I'm glad that we, yeah. I don't think there was any disagreement between us, buddy. I think we, we both agree there. Uh, we talked about a basic occlusal examination as well. Uh, the only thing I might do differently um, is a lot of a new patient examination, like there's so much to check for sometimes. So I, I will check for the degree of hypertrophy of the muscles, but I won't in every case check the, the, the origin, the body, uh, and the insertion of a master. For example, I'm saving that for, okay, are we now going further? Uh, are we going to be doing some dentistry? Or is this a patient who's complaining of headaches or they do actually have significant hypertrophy? So I sometimes, I, I reserve that for my, uh, so, so that my basic is like a BPE, like a BPE of occlusion. I'm doing certain things. Okay, this is a high functional risk. I'm going to do more. And one thing that you do, which um, I, I don't actually do, is you measure the, the full range of motion. I think that's great practice, by the way. So I think you should do it. But for me, the first time I see someone, can you stick your three fingers in your mouth? They can. Okay, fine. I, I'm going to move on now. Okay, that's my BPE. That was a code two or code one or code zero BPE. If they can't stick their three fingers in, that's a code four BPE equivalent, right? So like, okay, now I'm going to get the, the ruler out. So it's about... It's about maximizing your, your time and efficiency. Uh, but I think if you could, everyone could do it the way you do it is, is the best, is the gold standard way. I'm just giving those people who might have only 20 minute uh, new, pa new patient examinations something to work with here, you see. Um, 
Right, let's cover now, buddy, uh, relevance of the centric relation contact point. I'm just looking at the time. Uh, I think we've got another 10 minutes of this episode. Uh, We have to cover in the next 10 minutes, okay, uh, the relevance of the centric relation contact point, and then uh, which ties nicely with this. What if you rehab someone not in CR? What could happen? So, um, Mahmoud, let's go for it. What do you think is is the uh, relevance of the centric relation contact point in terms of you as a restorative dentist? Okay, so I mean, it becomes relevant in a few cases. Uh, Number one, I think, and the most probably important one is when you're trying to restore the terminal tooth in the arch. Um, So if you have a lower seven that's fractured and you've discussed it with the patient and you're going to crown it, um, there is a high, you know, there's a good chance that tooth is the centric relation contact point. This, this, Last tooth in the arch syndrome, okay, as requested by our gosh, I forgot his name, I'm so sorry. He messaged me yesterday, it might have been Jordan, I'm not sure. He says, Can we have an episode uh, on, on this? And I was like, Yes, this needs its own episode. So, uh, yes, it, last tooth in the arch syndrome is one, but I think we can, we'll literally be there half an hour talking about how to recognize it, how to prevent it, how to communicate to the patient with it. So, yes, uh, let's just take that as a point that, yeah, that is one very important point, but uh, I'm probably going to get you back, buddy, and we'll just discuss all about the, this concept, okay? Uh, because that can take a whole a load of time. So, yes, get, tell me some more because I want that to be its own episode. Okay. Um, so next, I use it personally. I use it to verify my centric relation mountings. So uh, you know, you check what it is in the mouth uh, when you're doing your. Uh, so I most of the time, to be honest, I prefer to use a leaf gauge. Uh, so I'll find the centric relation contact point. I'll take a picture of it. Now you verified it with shim stock. You know it's not a false contact. Once you've taken your two or three CR bites, then you're getting them mounted. I will then check that contact on the mounting. If it's exactly the same as in the mouth and the two bites are the same, you're pretty comfortable that your, uh, your mounting is correct. Um, so if I'm going to do an appliance, whether it's full coverage or uh, anterior only, um, I will check where their centric relation contact point is. And that will also give you, it will show you how much space you're going to have at the front if they can only hit on that point. Now, if they have a huge gap, you know that should they deprogram enough and you get mandibular repositioning um, and they do end up with an anterior open bite, you can show them how much of an open bite they're going to get. And that gives you really good informed consent because they've seen it. Um, and we know all the other sort of risk factors for an anterior open bite. I'm just going to remind everyone. So that A, if they have a large slide uh, and then uh, when you put them in central relation uh, with the with the leaf cage, for example, and then suddenly their mandible opens up, okay, especially if it's vertical, and now uh, they look very different. Their mandibles moved a lot. And if they, just like uh, Mahmoud said, if they deprogram, then they could have an AOB. Not because the anterior teeth intruded or the posterior is extruded, it's because their mandible shifted. But the other two risk factors here is if they've got a, a lack of a cuss fossa relationship with the back if they've got all flat teeth uh, then then the mandible almost uh, will find it difficult to to remember oh this is how i used to bite because it can't find its bite again and the other one is if they start off with a minimal overbite in the first place then even a tiny shift of the jaw will reveal the underlying aob so those are two other factors so yeah another great point there so uh, also to identify those who might be high risk of aob and like you said i, I love the fact that you said it's not only anterior only appliances it's also uh, uh, you know michigan's tanners any appliance okay can cause this and some people naturally over time through no through nothing at all will develop an AOB because uh, over time the teeth flatten uh, uh, and they almost uh, deprogram themselves uh, and then now that oh my my teeth used to fit together now they don't anymore they've equilibrated their own centric relation point on the point basically um, yeah the other the other time we use it uh, personally is again if you are if you have an anterior uh, tooth wear patient um, occasionally you can if you find that uh, center correlation contact point again you check and see that can give you enough space anteriorly to do your restorations and the reason that is handy is because again if you think about it if you restore them in that position they're actually still at the same ovd posteriorly so the risk of them having uh, a problem adapting or or you know as studies have shown you know whatever ovd they had uh, after you've restored them they're going to resort back to that ovd somehow um, you don't have that problem because you've actually maintained 
the same OVD. I believe it's also to do with the, the muscle length. The, the muscle length at that CSERP uh, is the same as it was at MIP. Sometimes, you know, sometimes if you have a vertical component, technically there is a, a vertical change, but at least that the muscle length will still be happy at that uh, first point of contact because it's already used to going there. You see, it's, it's developed with it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I've explained it so much better than me. <laughs> you can tell that you've been this a lot longer. Um, yeah, I think... Um, those are all the ones that, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to, to bounce off you to, to cover those. I mean, the main thing is we know, as we discussed from the last episode, and hopefully you agree with me, Mahmoud, that it is a, a position of a, a high restorative convenience, reproducibility, which is very advantageous uh, to us as restorative dentists. And I like the fact that you covered the last one. The big one is that we've got tooth wear and you feel like, oh, my God, I have no space to build up these front teeth. But actually, when you check that you, you suddenly have some space in their centriculation contact point, then that would be useful. The only other one I'd say uh, is... Um, if you do screen your patients routinely for where is their central relation contact point, and, and when you check, it's on a tooth, on a, let's say a premolar or a first molar or a second molar, uh, but that tooth has got a large restoration, it's got a nasty crack point there, um, then, then that uh, is something that, you, you know, if you take a photo and show the patient, like, look, this is your position where it hits first, and it, it might be no coincidence that this is a tooth that's the most battered or most destroyed, most damaged, because um, when we grind, our, we like to go in that position, uh, and so we're, therefore, for this tooth, it's higher risk, maybe we should be more proactive with it rather than reactive kind of thing. So sometimes just to identify, um, is it on a tooth that's already quite compromised, and perhaps when you come to restoring that tooth, you may be then opting for something indirect, gold perhaps, rather than direct, because, oh, now I now know one more piece of information about this tooth, that this is actually the centric relation contact point. So this may change. You might actually be a little bit more destructive in sometimes, very rarely, but to, to make sure that actually uh, you're future-proof the restoration. Right, and then this leads nicely to um, the, the two scenarios I spoke about last episode. Um, Mahmoud, you've been absolutely brilliant inspiring me here. It's, it, it's, been, it's been so good to just bounce ideas. Honestly, that last episode, I struggled so much. It was like, ah, it was like uh, just the monologue. I just loved having you here. And, you know, you, you, you're such a knowledgeable guy. You said all the right things. It's amazing. Uh, so so that, that scenario that you have uh, it, that, that I discussed uh, in the last episode, whereby you have someone who's very class two div one, right? They're very goofy. And then you find that if you take them into relation they become goofier or you have airway concerns um, and then maybe in that position you're gonna just restore them in an arbitrary position okay uh, what are the disadvantages uh, of doing MIP complex dentistry versus not doing or versus doing centric relation contact point complex dentistry uh, I mean, the disadvantages, yeah, you lose, you probably, probably lose the uh, repeatability of the, uh, of the uh, position. So, I mean, I've had, uh, I've had a, a few people sort of ask uh, in terms of my uh, workflow when I do these things. And it's like, okay, you, you know, you've got your CR mounts and you're, you're going to get a wax up. And I'll always do my best to try and try that wax up on, you know, um, before I touch anything. So you always try for an additive wax up. And then, um, so you do the additive wax up, you flash it on, and the bite's all over the place. And you're thinking, you know, what's going on? Well, it's probably because you spent 10, 15, 20 minutes deprogramming the patient when you took the CR bite records. So what makes you think that now you can just stick, you know, they've not been wearing an appliance, they haven't been wearing an anterior deprogrammer, and you've tried this flash on in, and they're not biting on it the way you, it is on the articulator because their position is different. You haven't deprogrammed them again. So it's kind of, it might be the same thing. You know, you, you're, you're going to assume you're going to restore them in this position that isn't CR. So you, it's not repeatable. You do your wax up and basically you're going to have to rely on uh, putting it in and, and adjusting it and using the mouth as the articulator and hoping you can adjust it in uh, enough. And it might be fine. It might be absolutely fine. Or you might end up adjusting the daylights out of these restorations uh, you end up with teeth that look like chewing gum or fracturing easily because they're thin. Or I guess worst case scenario is if that patient does go into CR when they power function, you're probably going to be, you're going to have them and they're probably only going to be occluding on sevens. Now, chances are, even if your beautiful zirconia or whatever it is you put on there, it probably still won't be enough. It, it might well fracture. That is not even taking into consideration all the other you know, there's three parts to the system. You've got the teeth, you've got the TMJs, you've got the muscles. And, you know, the failure might happen with any one of them. You can have symptoms of the TMJ, you can have symptoms of the muscles, you can have problems with the teeth. Um, so 
it's it's one of those where I would rather be in CR because I know that it's a repeatable position. So when I take my wax up, put it in the mouth, when I take my provisionals, put them in the mouth, I know that I've got repeatability. Um, so again, like we said earlier, it really is a position of convenience. There's nothing magical about it. It just happens to be somewhere you can uh, guide the patient into or their muscles can guide them into, which is my preferred uh, method. Um, and unless the, the bone has remodeled, you're going to get them there or thereabouts every single time. Well, um, you, you said all the main points that I had in terms of what are the compromises that you, you make. But the, the, the main one I want to highlight is, is the last one you said, basically, where uh, if you just build everything into MIP, and sometimes you have to because of those two scenarios that I said, right? But just accept the fact that when the masters and temporize, everything contracts uh, and the mandible distalizes and they, and they hit their central relation contact point, uh, then they, just like you said, may be occluding only on the sevens. And, and just like maybe the before the crown that you did uh, or before the restorations that you did, they already had a battered and destroyed tooth. Well, they're going to do the same to your restoration. So factor that in. So maybe this patient will need some sort of appliance, or, you know, whether it's built into CR or not, to, to give them that extra protection on that tooth because you know that, okay, you haven't been able to uh, mitigate that one scenario because of the fact that you're taking compromise. So basically, uh, imagine that they're, they're grinding backwards into their centering relation. And as they're grinding uh, backwards, there's, there's no smooth transition. They're, they're, they're hitting against these rocky, bumpy, inclines of the crowns basically and that's where potentially chipping and problems can happen as well uh wow that was an intense one Mahmood. we we covered uh, all those uh and that was that was really intense but i really loved it man honestly really enjoyed uh talking to us i, I enjoyed sparring with you there uh, and I, I think me and you are, are cut from the same occlusal cloth uh and uh, yeah I, i'd love to have you on again on on a last tooth in the arch syndrome because i think that'd be really useful it's really bugging me that my colleague who who, who messaged me saying hey jazz can we have the episode in this um I, I'm going to find it and I'm going to record it in the outro. So thank you to the person who, who recommended that. Um, Mahmoud, you are having number three. Your wife is having number three soon, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes, definitely not me. She's yes, of course. Right. She had some, <laughs> some role, uh, which is why you're off today because it, it might have been happening. So yeah, I wish you all the best. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have you on. And thanks for being part of our Telegram group. Uh, it's, it's been really great to have your input. Uh, and I hope that we may meet someday very soon. You're, you're, you, where do you live again? Uh, Sutton Caulfield so uh, what's amazing well I hope we meet one day soon I'm sure we will mate yeah I'm sure we will man thanks so much for uh, for having me it, it was good fun actually well there we have it guys Mahmoud Ibrahim how awesome was he you need to follow him on Instagram it's Dr. Moi Dental Moi as in Francais right Moi Dental so Dr. M-O-I Dental his work is amazing message him he's such a great guy and if you want to join our Telegram app where me Mahmoud uh, lots of others are on there always helping out Pab's on there it's protrusive.co.uk forward slash telegram and that will take you to the telegram group join us we're always a, a little helpful community there and I just wanted to say a shout out to Dr. Chiggs Gohill Chiggs thank you it was you who recommended that we cover the last tooth in the arch syndrome i.e. you place a crown or you do a crown prep on the last molar and you get the patient to bite together and you've lost all the space how can we manage that scenario so we'll cover that at some point soon as well uh, and also before I forget on the website protrusive.co.uk uh, under this episode I will put the three-minute occlusal examination initially by Stephen Davies uh, and contributed to or uh, modified by uh, Mahmood. So I'll, I'll stick that on again uh, as a handout. I'll even email it to you if you're on the newsletter group, okay? Thanks so much for listening all the way to the end and I'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>